The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the traditional Catholic faith and religion as professed and practiced by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of the Second Vatican Council and the so-called New Order of Mass. Hello, welcome to another special edition of What Catholics Believe. And we continue this evening with our treatment of the encyclical of Pope St. Pius X, Pascendi Dominici Gregis, issued on September 8th in 1907. The encyclical deals with the errors of the modernists, and it actually constitutes a condemnation of the errors of the modernists, whom St. Pius X characterized as the most dangerous enemies that the Catholic Church has ever faced. Now, in our treatment of modernism in Pascendi, we got as far as number 11 in the encyclical, but it would be a good idea to uh, perhaps reiterate, to review. After beginning the encyclical, by explaining that and why the modernists are the greatest enemies ever to attack the faith, to attack the church, St. Pius X begins an analysis of their doctrines. He begins to uh, state their doctrines and then begins to, as I say, analyze them. And uh, as you recall, St. Pius X begins by talking about the modernist philosophy, the modernist as a philosopher. And again, this might be a somewhat esoteric and a little confusing to folks who haven't had much philosophy, uh, formal philosophical training, but the concepts are really not that difficult to grasp. In uh, covering them, uh, in Pascendi, one might be thinking today, well, I haven't heard uh, my Novus Ordo bishop or any of the Novus Ordo popes actually expound these philosophical ideas, but uh, that's not really what is important here. In giving the philosophical ideas of the modernist, uh, Pope St. Pius X was actually laying the groundwork to understand their conclusions. And when St. Pius gets to the conclusions of the modernists, is where we really see the Novus Ordo in all of its inglorious nature, in the conclusions of modernism, which are exactly the, the, the teachings of the Novus Ordo, the New Order. Well, we'll see this as time goes on. I'm not concentrating on those conclusions right now. I'm following the order that St. Pius X gave in analyzing the philosophical underpinnings of the modernist theology and the modernist belief system and finally the modernist teachings of dogma and the church and, and uh, the hierarchy and so on. Uh, we'll see all of that unfold and we'll relate all of the teachings of the modernists to uh, the modernists as described in St. Pius' encyclical and the modernists we're watching in action today in the modern modernist church. We'll see the correlation there, and I think it'll be very clear. For the time being, though, let's, let's just remember that St. Pius X told us the modernist philosophy begins with non-knowing, and that is to say, the human intellect cannot really reach truth. Even the truth of the world around us, it can only have impressions, and it can only have uh, experience phenomena of the things around us. And therefore, since it's impossible for the human mind to know the creatures of this world, the creation, it's impossible that we go through the creation to know the Creator. And so St. Pius X said that the modernist begins with this phenomenology, this phenomenalist looking at things, at all things in the world. Uh, the human mind can only know as sort of uh, impressions, as sort of almost, almost illusions, phenomena, but can never really get to the reality of things, and, uh, and, and all the more reason cannot know the God who created these things. And uh, the modernist, therefore, is left to explain uh, where, where does faith come from? Where does religion come from? I mean, if faith is not something of the intelligence, if it's not something of truth known to the mind, <coughs> then where does, where does faith come in? 
the modernist realizes there is faith in the world, it's clear. I mean, people do have faith, but where does it come from? It's not something related to the, the, the human intellect's knowledge of truth as revealed from outside of us by a God who is outside of us. The modernist says, well, the, that all faith has to come from within us, individually. It has to come from within us. And uh, the modernist says, each of us has a need for the divine. It doesn't really define what the divine is, just something beyond. And uh, that then is expressed in the religious sentiment. So actually all faith, all religion, um, all doctrine comes from that um, religious sentiment set in motion by this need and the need being answered by an experience that the individual has. The individual has some kind of uh, uh, mystical experience, he doesn't use the word mystical, but experience of the divine. And uh, that uh, from this divine then, the human being has to, each individual has to develop as from a seed, the, the kernel of experience into an expression of thought, and that thought then is expressed into a more, in a more elaborate way as a dogma, and the dogmas then become central to the expression of that faith experience. We're, we're going to see where that leads us. We got as far as saying this, the modernist believes that Jesus was a man of exceptional qualities, and uh, that he had a very powerful need for the divine and a very powerful religious sentiment. And because of that, he also had, consequently, a very powerful experience of the divine. That Jesus of Nazareth had a uniquely powerful experience of the divine. So powerful, in fact, that when he expressed it to others, it attracted them to him as though he was their teacher, that he, they also could share in his exceptionally powerful experience of the divine. They became his disciples because they wanted to share in his experience of the divine. And so they, they began by transfiguring him during his lifetime into someone uh, above the normal. But he could actually work miracles. And then after his death, they disfigured his memory by proclaiming him the Son of God. And uh, it was as long as Jesus lived, and as they say in the creed, was crucified, died, and was buried, he was the Christ of history. But when he was buried, that was the end of the Christ of history. And that's when the Christ, I'm sorry, that's when the Jesus of history ended. And that is when the Christ of faith began. So the modernists will make the distinction between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. This is the disfigured memory of Christ, filled with mythology, so that the modernists would say we have to demythologize faith to arrive at the reality of who Jesus is really was as a man, as the Jesus of history. Um, in any case, it's interesting to make note of these things as St. Pius X expresses them because we see these things coming up, coming up in the, in the teachings of John Paul II, um, Benedict XVI, uh, certainly in Francis. We see these things bubbling to the surface almost exactly with the same terminology. As we saw the terminology um, being employed by John the Twenty-Third, so all through this history, since from the, John the Twenty-Third on, we see the very terminology of modernism being used and the concepts of modernism being introduced and used as the fundamental reason for the changes that made in the religion, to produce a modernist religion that is a practice of modernism, which we know as the, the New Order, the Novus Ordo. But let's, let's continue where uh, St. Pius X left off 
after they talk about transfiguring the idea of Jesus Christ during his lifetime and then disfiguring his memory afterwards, um, they go on to talk about the, um, the, the way that religion, religion comes about from these, these ideas of theirs, the religious sentiment uh, through vital imminence, they say, some kind of living power develops the religious sentiment uh, that it resides in the subconsciousness and is the germ of our religion, as the modernists say, and as St. Pius X points out. Now, uh, St. Pius X says that it is crazy, but they say they're going to reform the church with these ideas of theirs. He calls them, he says, they boast that they are going to reform the church by these ravings. Now remember, he wrote this in 1907, long before the re reformers burst onto the scene in John the 23rd's day, 50 years later. In any case, we come to number 11, the origin of dogmas. Now Francis has made no secret of his contempt for dogma, even the very idea of dogma because dogma to him represents something rigid and unchangeable. And for him, remember, all faith comes from experience, and experience is something that changes. And so dogma is only a representation, a kind of a remote a second or third hand representation of the original religious experience. And as that religious experience develops in mankind through time, so dogma has to change with it. There's no such thing as unchangeable dogma any, any, any more than there is unchangeable truth, any more than there is unchangeable experience. All of these things have to evolve in the modernist mind. In fact, Francis even went so far as to even define tradition as change. He says the tradition of the Catholic Church is change. There you are. That's one tradition. That's the tradition of the Church. Everything changes. And it has to continually change. Pure modernism. Here's what St. Pius X says with regard to dogmas. He said, so far there hasn't been a lot of mentioning of the intellect in the modernist scheme, except to say that the intellect really can't attain truth. And therefore, the intellect really is not the means of divine revelation. It's not the means of finding religious truth. That comes through a sentiment. But, St. Pius X, the intellect does play a role after the religious experience has taken place because now the human being has to express that. He has to put that somehow into words, even so that he can understand it himself, even though he, even so he can grasp what he's experienced. He has to express that, and that's where the intellect comes in. And the intelligence has to take the, the experience of the divine that the religious sentiment has received and has presented to the intelligence. The intelligence then has to find a way to, to, to express it. The, the religious experience is kind of confused and uh, the mind, the intellect, wants to start trying to make it more precise and kind of nail it down into words, as it were. And so um, the, the task of the intellect, he said, is to reflect on and analyze the religious experience that the individual has had. That the, the intellect then almost transforms forms the original religious experience into kind of mental pictures. And in doing so, suddenly the, the experience of the, of the original religious uh, event that took place in the sentiment, the religious sentiment, enters into the world of phenomena. As soon as the intellect starts working on it, starts thinking about it, starts reflecting on it, starts analyzing it, and starts expressing it in words, suddenly it is actually moving that religious experience 
into the realm of the phenomenal world in which we live. That's the result of the expression that the intellect puts on it, almost like clothing the religious experience, clothing it in a way, in the language of the imagination, in the language then of the intellect. So it tries to formulate it into a statement. Uh, St. Pius X says the intellect wants to, to express this in words. <clears throat> and so the modernists say that the religious man must ponder his faith experience. So um, the, the operation of the intellect, St. Pius X says here in number 11, then, is a double operation. The intellect does two things with that religious experience. First of all, it spontaneously expresses it uh, as, as a concept in a very simple, ordinary, plain statement. God is good, even just God is. God is love. Very simple statement. Okay, this is the first expression of the religious experience in the intellect. But then there's a second step. The, the mind goes from that simple, ordinary statement through a kind of deeper process of reflecting and actually begins to elaborate the thought and elaborate the expression. And the, the secondary proposition comes out of that. In other words, you have the primary proposition, which is very simple, almost like a reaction to the experience and expressing it almost uh, uh, reflexively. But then the mind begins working on the experience and turns it into a, these more elaborate statements which are known as dogmas. And that's where dogmas come from. They're like the secondary statements of the intellect reflecting on the faith experience. <coughs> and they're almost necessary not for the individual so much as for the person to communicate to others the experience or try to communicate to others the experience that he's had. So he says that once the secondary formulas that, that a person comes up with to express his faith experience, once they become current, they can even be approved by the magisterium of the church as dogmas, as, as dogmas of faith. And so St. Pius says in number 12, we have one of the principal points of the modernist system regarding the origin and the nature of dogmas. He's explained where, where faith comes from, the experience. He's explained where these, um, these primary formulas come from, which are very simple statements. He, he's explaining now where do dogmas come from, dogmas of faith. He says, they place the origin of dogma in these primitive simple formulas, which then uh, are, are, are like revelation. And then they are developed into more uh, elaborate, complex statements known as, well, dogmas, when they are made as kind of standards that everyone must adhere to. They furnish the believer, he says, with a means of giving an account of his faith to himself. And then, of course, after giving an account of his faith to himself, he is faced with giving an account of his faith to others as well. So they say that these, these expressions or these statements of faith stand kind of between the believer and his faith experience because First of all, they're an expression of his faith, but they're not really adequate. In other words, the statements of faith put into words, the statements of faith that express the faith experience can't really do justice to the original faith experience. Words cannot really express the fullness of the faith experience. So these expressions, whether they be the original primitive formula or the more expanded elaborate formulas, which become the dogmas, can't really express the truth or the reality of the faith experience entirely. They're actually just symbols, inadequate symbols or mere instruments, means by which he expresses 
the thought as well as he can. But remember that since these statements are merely like not truth, but images of the truth. The truth is the experience. The expressions of the experience, the statements, are mere images or symbols of the original truth. And so they have to adapt. You see, man is living, and so he's having constant development of his thoughts. He has constant development of his experience. And as the human race continues on its way through time, the development and the, the, continue, the continued experiences that, that man has as he goes on through life, his own life, and the entire of humanity goes through life, century after century, these experiences develop and change, they evolve. They evolve. And therefore the dogmas have to evolve too. The statements of the faith experience become downright false unless they keep up with the evolution of the experiences themselves. The experiences of the divine are continually evolving and therefore the way you express them must continually evolve too. This is uh, something that St. Pius X brings out in number 13. These statements must be adapted to man. They must continually adapt to man. There are an infinite variety of these experiences, these faith experiences in mankind, and therefore there must be, as it were, an infinite variety of the statements, expressions relating to them. And not only does do these experiences vary from individual to individual throughout the entire human race, over the entire globe, at any one time, but they're, they're also continually evolving throughout time as well. So you see, the statements that are trying to express these experiences must be continually in a state of evolution. Otherwise, they become false because they don't actually correspond to the faith experience of mankind now. They are reflective only of, and expressive only of the faith experience of the time in which they took place to the individual to whom it took place or the individuals who chose to follow him. So that's why St. Pius X says, not only are dogmas uh, liable to change, they are absolutely required to change. There's intrinsic evolution of dogmas, absolutely necessary. What he says is, dogma is not only able, but ought to evolve and to be changed. Uh, otherwise, dogmas become kind of obsolete, almost as soon as they're formulated, as the religious experience continues merrily evolving on its way. Um, and so, again, this Evolution is all contained in the idea of a vital imminence, that all of this comes from within, within inside man, and man is continually developing by life. And so religious formulas, to be really religious and not merely theological speculations, ought to be living. Now we hear this a lot these days. Well, the Bible is a living document. Scripture is a living document. The Constitution of the United States is a living document. They think this is saying something good, and it sounds good. I mean, after all, the opposite of living is dead, right? So when they tell you that Scripture is living, they're saying it's not dead. When they say the Constitution is living, they mean it's not dead. No, no, that's not what they mean. Their point is, because it is living, it has this vital imminence, meaning it is continually in need of being changed. It is continually, the understanding of it, needs to continually evolve, meaning that they should be able to interpret it as they see fit, to, ref to correspond to their own particular mindset, their own particular faith experience at the time. That's what they mean by calling the scriptures a living document. This is what they mean by talking about a living church. Anything alive, they say, has to evolve. Anything to be living must be constantly changing. So it is with religion, 
And so it is, they say, with the Catholic religion. To be a living, it has to be evolving. It has to be continually changing. When it stops changing, it dies. This is the modernist idea. And so <clears throat> these religious formulas that we, we know grow into dogmas, um, they have to be continually adapted. They have to be sanctioned by the heart because after all, they, they actually originate in the heart with the faith experience. And they must evolve under the guidance of the heart, not the mind, not the intellect, but the heart. It's really a matter of feeling. Remember, it's all a matter of sentiment with them. All religion, all faith is a matter. It is a product of the sentiment of man. And what they say is, if for any reason this adaptation of doctrine should cease, then they lose their first meaning, and if they aren't changed, they die. And those who tenaciously cling to them will die with them. The faith experience dies with them. And so it, it's almost like reading Francis today to read this section 13 of Pope Pius the Tenth, the Pope Pius the Tenth encyclical, when the modernists condemn that clinging tenaciously and vainly to meaningless formulas, formulas that have become meaningless because the faith experience has evolved beyond them. And that means that the religion will then go to ruin if it is no longer evolving with the religious experience of mankind. Now, St. Pius X said they're blind, he said. They're blind and they would pervert all true religion. He says they pervert the concept of e the eternal concept of truth because they have a passion for novelty, constant change, constant invention. Well, I guess everybody wants to be able to take credit for coming up with something new and different. And so, you know, we have the idea of hope and change. We have the idea of change, change. Everything's about change, right? Change in itself is considered to be a good thing. Just change of anything, change of any way. This is, of course, the Marxist idea that you destroy the old and you build something new. And because it is something new, it must be something better. Uh, the Marxists, the liberals, the leftists, the, uh, the, the modernists, they all have the same basic thought patterns here. Um, but this gives them a, a, an aura, in their own minds at least, of being real reformers because they're coming up with something new. Now what they're coming up with must be something, the same old horrible thing that was tried before and with disastrous results. But as far as the modernist concerns, is concerned, the human being has evolved to another level. What didn't work before can work now. We're continually trying to dust off socialism and make it work. The modernist leads the way in the, these patterns because uh, you know, in his estimation, we're coming up with new concepts and yes, we're kind of growing into these ideas that failed before, but now because we're more mature, we're, more, we're, we're able to make these things work now. It's vanity and audacity. And these are the two things that St. Pius X said characterize the modernist. The modernist in his thinking is full of vanity and in his action is full of audacity. These are the two things St. Pius X characterized the modernist. And you see it here in St. Pius X's number 13 of Pishendi, perverting the concept of truth, the eternal concept of truth, and having a passion for novelty. Now he goes on to the question of the modernist as believer. So having provided the idea of the modernist uh, as philosophical under underpinnings, the mindset in which he starts these ravings, St. Pius X goes on to say, well, what does it do to his faith? And this is where things pick up a little bit, I believe, because uh, laying the philosophical foundations, was that was the hard part. And drawing the conclusions uh, uh, as to how this produces the modernist as believer, the modernist uh, as theologian and so on, is relatively easy once you understand these basic principles of modernist thought. Uh, according to belief, uh, St. Pius X says, um, 
all belief is based upon individual experience that gives rise to religious certitude for the individual. He says, uh, as the modernist, as a believer, has this, this certainty that the divine reality does really exist. He's experienced it. He has personally experienced the divine reality. This is the whole point of the religious sentiment. And so his certitude rests in the experience of the individual. That's himself. Okay. And so it is a kind of intuition of the heart. Again, not truth assented to by the intelligence, but an intuition of the heart that gives him the conviction, uh, the certitude of faith, belief. He has come into the immediate contact with the very reality of God by his religious experience. And he knows that it's a real experience, at least it's real for him. It's subjectively real. And so it is this experience, when the person had it, that makes him properly and truly a believer. So to be properly and truly a believer, one has to have had this faith experience, this immediate contact with the very reality of God. Those who haven't had that experience, erupting from the need, pressing upon their religious sentiment, those who haven't had that experience cannot really be said to be truly believers. Oh, they may believe in dogmas, they may believe in, uh, in dogmas, dogmas of faith, but all they're really doing is trying to uh, somehow connect with the religious experiences of, of others in the past. But having had that religious experience themselves, that's another matter. Until they do, they're not really believers. And um, you can see how this sort of actually melds with Protestantism too. Uh, modernism has roots in Protestantism as well. And uh, so he points out, St. Pius X points out here that the way is actually open to atheism here. Because he says, given this doctrine of experience and the doctrine of symbolism, that this experience is the truth and symbols, uh, statements are actually only representations of the truth, then he says, well, then every religion must be true. Why? Because in every religion, by definition, the modernist says, there are these faith experiences. After all, that's where all religion comes from. So even pagan religions come from faith experiences. And these faith experiences are real. The individuals, whether Christians or pagans or atheists or whoever, whoever they are, if they have an experience of the divine, it's real for them. And it's as real for one as it is for another. It's as real for the Catholic as it is for the Lutheran. It's as real as it, for the Lutheran as it is for the Jewish man or the Muslim. It's as real as for the Jew and the Muslim as it is for the Zoroastrian, the Hindu, and uh, the, the Taoist and all the rest. It's all real. All religion is by definition, therefore the product of religious experience, and all of those religious experiences are real. <coughs> So the modernist comes to the conclusion, all religions are true. Here you have the origins of ecumenism. The whole idea we can all learn from each other because we've all got different aspects of the truth, of the divine. All these religions are based upon experiences of the divine, which is the infinite. And we each have our limited expressions of that. If we can all bring them all together, or maybe even better yet, leave them all aside, all of those dogmas, because they're only symbols, and they're only partial, and they're only temporary. Let's all try to experience, let's all try to have the same faith experience. Then we can grow into a one world religion, with one expression, one common expression, of that one common faith experience that we can all have together. This is the object of ecumenism. The idea that all religions are true and this is a necessary result of the modernist idea. The modernist even gives, gives some ground to this, that some religious 
dogmas, or let's say the experiences are all real, but when these experiences are expressed in language, well, those expressions can vary. Some better, some worse, some more perfect, some less perfect. So while the experiences may all be, you might say, equally real for the experiencer, the way these experiences are expressed can be more or less right or justified, more perfect, less perfect. And how do you distinguish between not so much the faith experience, but the value of the way it's expressed, the modernist says, <clears throat> the faith experiences that are not expressed very well die out. They die away. They don't have that vital imminence anymore to keep them going, keep them evolving, keep them developing. And so these are religions that come upon the scene for a while and eventually just sort of evaporate because their expression was less perfect. The principle of vital imminence in a religion shows that it is true insofar as it exists, insofar as it is growing, insofar as it is thriving, insofar as it is changing, insofar as it is evolving, it is living. And so when you have a faith experience that is well expressed and expressed in a way that it is very flexible and adaptable and continually being re-expressed and re-expressed in a new and interesting way, there you have a living religion. And that gives you the difference between the real uh, living quality of, a, of, of religions, one religion over another. Why some religions survive and thrive and others just eventually wither away. And for the modernist, as a member of the Catholic Church, as a reformer of the Catholic Church, his concern, because of his love for the Church, is that the Church not calcify, that the Church not become rigid in her dogmas, because then the Church will die. And so he sees himself as basically saving the Church's life. He is ridden onto the scene as the cavalry, as the knight in shining armor, <clears throat> to save the church from death, <clears throat> certain death due to <clears throat> her holding on to the old forms of her faith, her belief, <clears throat> of her worship, uh, of her government, all of these things. These are the three essential things that have to change in order to keep the church alive so that the church can evolve beyond this stage and go to the next stage of her life. <clears throat> so um, we come to the question then in number 15 of religious experience and tradition. <clears throat> um, St. Pius X says applying this doctrine experience and evolution to tradition destroys the very concept of tradition. Again, think of, think of, <clears throat> think of uh, Francis that the tradition of the church is change. That's an, or, or, that's an oxymoron. <clears throat> How do you have a new tradition? Tradition presumes that something went before it, but a brand new tradition is something you're just starting that you want to become a tradition. Anyway, you see the oxymoronic nature of, of, uh, of modernism in this, and Francis's statement that the tradition of the church is change. Um, That, that no wonder St. Pius X said that the modernist concept of tradition is to destroy it. Tradition, he says, is understood as a communication to others through preaching by means of the intellectual formula we talked about of an original experience. We're trying to communicate this original experience in formulas, again, <coughs> by preaching. But he says this is given to stimulate the religious sentiment to have its own renewed religious experience. And this is meant to renew in believers their original religious experience or the religious experience of another. For example, renew, renewing in us 
or even giving to us for the first time the experience of Jesus long ago, that we may relive his experience of the divine. But, as St. Pius X points out, in order to do this, this tradition cannot be fixed. It has to be evolving also. The religious experience as it is propagated among the peoples, not only in the peoples of the world today, but future generations also, <coughs> must be done in a certain way. <coughs> he says that sometimes this communication of religious experience, which is tradition, takes root and thrives. He says that other times this communication of religious experience withers and dies out. <coughs> How do you know what's true? Well, if the religious experience can be communicated by the doctrines, by the traditions, then these are still living. And they are worthy of life. And insofar as they are worthy of life, they are also truth. Life and truth are the same thing. If something is living, it is true by the very fact that it is living. And it is true, it is living because it is true, and it is true because it is living, as the modernists would say. So this is why the modernist says all the religions on the face of the earth right now must be equally true because they're all alive. They're all not only continuing to survive, but they are propagating, they are continuing on to the next generation. All religions that do that are vital and living religions, and they are all therefore true. So you can't make a distinction between Catholicism, <coughs> Mohammedanism, Judaism, or any religion that is actually surviving and making progress in the world today. They are all true <coughs> because they all are alive. They're all remaining and, as it were, uh, evolving. Now, the modernist actually, uh, St. Pius X rather, goes on to consider faith and science. I'm going to pass over that for just, uh, for this moment. That's number 16. <clears throat> because I want to get to, uh, well, let's see. Let us go to the modernist as a theologian. Yes. But uh, we come to the modernist development of the idea of the church. And this is where I want to leave you today because I want to show you, before I break off in this third installment of the treatment of modernism, I want to move ahead in the encyclical to show you something that I find very striping, striking. And that is the correspondence between St. Pius X's outline of the modernist concept of the church and Francis's own statement of what the church is and how it should be in his mind. I'm going to do this. I'm going to move ahead in the encyclical actually as far as number 23 now, skipping over about oh, almost 10 sections because we can get lost in all the deliberations here and what we're really trying to do is to show that what we're reading in, in uh, Pescendi, we're seeing now living as living reality in the modernist Novus Ordo Church. And what we're reading in Pescendi about the modernist concept of the church, we are actually hearing now out of the mouth of Francis Bergoglio. <coughs> I think it is a very striking correspondence and it should help us to renew our interest in this question of modernism. It seems to be getting very heavy and belabored when we stay in the realm of mere theory. Only when we actually see its application in the world today and in the modernist church today can we really appreciate what St. Pius X saw in his vision of the modernist church that would emerge from these errors. <coughs> so let me go to number 23. 
And this is the modernist idea of the church. He says, when we, when we consider the modernist idea of the church itself, and here he's referring to the Catholic Church, what the Catholic Church should be, the church that the modernist intends to reform, <clears throat> what the modernist conceives the church should be. <coughs> he says, we, we already recognize that the church is born of a double need. The need of the individual believer to express his faith experience and the need of the individual believer to communicate his faith experience to others. Those are the two things he, he needs to do. And so he says this is necessary this requires a society, as it were, a society which we will call the church. And that society that every believer really needs to not only uh, to account for and express and understand his own faith experience, but also to communicate his faith experience to others, that society is meant to guard, increase, and propagate the common good and the faith experience, which is at its very root. So what is the church, then, according to the modernist? St. Pius X says, the church is the product of the collective consciousness, or conscience. <clears throat> I guess nowadays we'd say consciousness. But in the day that he was writing, the expression was the collective conscience. That is to say, the church is the product of the society of individual consciences which by virtue of the principle of vital permanence all depend on one first believer, in our case, Jesus of Nazareth, who for Catholics is Christ. And the elements of cohesion in the society are doctrine and worship. These are the things that kind of hold the society together. These are the elements that kind of unite the society in common belief and common practice. He says, therefore, the church has a triple authority in the mind of the modernist. <clears throat> it has a disciplinary authority, it has a dogmatic authority, and it has a liturgical authority. Disciplinary in terms of what we'd call government, <coughs> dogmatic in terms of teaching, and liturgical in form of terms of worship. He says the nature of the authority has to you know, come, come from very, very origins. And uh, he, the modernist says there was a common error in the past <clears throat> that authority came to the church from outside, directly from God. He said, the modernist says this is not accurate. But the modernist says <clears throat> that instead of having this autocratic church with authority bestowed on it from some God from the outside, rather that the origin of the church is a vital emanation of the collective consciousness of the people. And so the authority in the church also has to emanate from the collective consciousness of the people. That's where authority has to come from. And so, <clears throat> Just like the church has its origin in the religious conscience, in religious experience, and the church is subject to that. So the authority of the church also has to be subject to the religious consciousness of the believers. <clears throat> and so this proposes an idea of what you might even call a democratic church, that authority has to come up from the society, from the community of believers upward. It's not a matter of Christ creating a hierarchy and bestowing upon the hierarchy authority. No, 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 that's not it. It's the collective consciousness in the church, all centering around the religious experience of uh, Jesus of Nazareth long, long ago and far, far away. It is from that collective consciousness that all real authority has to come. And so the ecclesiastical authority, the modernist, has to take the shape of democracy. 
<clears throat> it has to be in the form of democracy, which corresponds to the mentality of the modern day. And so the, the modernist says, unless the church adopts a democratic form of government, <clears throat> that the church will be at odds with the society, not only the society in which we live, but the church will even be, in a sense, at war with herself. Uh, <clears throat> the church will be resisting that vital imminence, that evolution that she has to be undergoing. And um, well, is not evolving as she should. And they even talk about the church exploding because of that tension <clears throat> between this hierarchical idea of top-down authority originating in God, bestowed upon, let's say, apostles and Peter and so on, and totally opposed to the idea of the real idea, as the monarchs would say, of the community of believers being the source of all real authority to, to govern them. And so again, here the modernist says, I'm saving the church from this potential disaster. I, I see that the church is rigidly, dogmatically holding on to these old forms of authority, this old concept of authority, as coming from God to the church through a hierarchy. Now we have to realize that this is, this is not true. This is not what the religious experience of the religious sentiment of mankind is right now. And so that's where the truth is. In the religious sentiment of man, in experiencing the divine right now, it's democratic. And the church has to get on board with that. And so the, the modernist wants to reform the church to save it by militating for this democratic concept of authority in the church. And uh, moving ahead here to the magisterium here, um, and, and I don't want to say too much because I don't want this to be too long or too involved. Let me just summarize, if I may, because I want to get to what Francis is saying here. Okay. <clears throat> the, the modernist says <coughs> that because all religion, all faith, comes from the faith experience of the people, then it is to the people we have to go to find out what the faith is and where the faith is right now. We have to take a read on the experiences of the common people to understand where the faith experience, that is the experience of the divine, is right now and by rights ought to be in the church. We can't consult um, apostles, we can't consult in a hierarchy, um, as though they had authority to teach the church. The place of the hierarchy is to discern the faith experience from the people and to kind of distill that so that the pastors listen to the people, very anti-clerical, the, the modernists. Not as though the pastors are anyway over the people, rather the pastors are there to listen to the people. That is especially true of the bishops then, that they are to listen to their people, and they are to gather the thoughts of the people into uh, kind of working documents even, that they then present to the Holy See, even the Pope. And the Pope is meant then to take the pastors and the bishops' reflections and uh, analysis and all of the people's thoughts about the faith as they're actually practicing it and living it today. They have to kind of distill that down and present that distillation to the Pope. And the Pope is the, then has a role in the modernist church to reflect upon and discern in what the bishops have given the Pope from what they've gotten from the people. The Pope has then to formulate that expression of the religious experience. It starts with the religious experience of the people. 
the formulas then begin to be, begin to be put together into words, as we said before. And these words then as formulae, you might say, formulizing or formulating what the people are experiencing of the divine at this moment, those formulae the Pope has to take and he has to further distill them down into statements. <clears throat> and those statements then become the new dogma. <clears throat> this is how it works in the church, according to the modernist. So again, at the risk of just being, you know, pedantic and going over and over again, but I, I think it's important, very important con concept to understand. Um, so you understand what's happening before your very eyes right now, what you're being told from the Vatican. The church exists as a society of the people who come together to share the faith experience. Their faith experience is where true faith is to be found now. The faith experience is found in the people. They're living the faith in the real world. The pastors listen to them and pass on to the bishops. The bishops then listen and pass on to the pope. And the pope's role then is to take what started with the, re the religious experience of the people and to express it in a formula that would uh, reflect where the faith is at that moment, as the people are actually experiencing it, as the people are actually living it. Now, to a Catholic, this makes no sense whatsoever. This is completely the opposite of what it's supposed to be. But what is shocking, perhaps to some people, is that if you look at the writings of Francis, the modernist concept, as outlined by St. Pius X, is exactly Francis's concept of the Church, exactly, to a T. And St. Pius X could have actually taken the words of Francis and put it right into his encyclical to say this is exactly the modernist concept of the church. <clears throat> we need to remember that in October of the year 2012, the council of the secretariat of the synod of bishops meeting actually refers to Francis as, as saying we need a new idea of the papacy. He's, he's introduced the idea we need a synodal church. And you know, this is the whole idea, isn't it? Getting the bishops together to listen to the people. And the people are going to fill the bishops in on what the faith experience in is at that moment. That is why they are bringing in the common people to talk to the bishops in these synods. Whether it's the youth synod the bishops are there to listen to the youth and there the young people's faith experience because that's where the truth is now. And just as they brought in the in these synods of the family, they brought in families of all kinds. Uh, even by the modern definition of family, broken homes, uh, they brought in uh, uh, adulterous, you know, all these people had to come and speak to tell the bishops where the true faith experience was at that moment as they were daily living their lives. And the bishops then had to, as I say, distill this down into a statement, the synodal statement that was presented to the Pope so he then could go from that as a working document to produce his own statements of, of doctrine and morals. That's what Bergoglio, that's what Francis has been trying to do ever since. This is his concept of the synodal church, exactly what Pope Pius X condemns as the erroneous church of the modernists. Now, we see uh, as related, uh, actually from L'Osservatore Romano, the edition of June 14th of the year 2013, says of Francis, finally, coming to the question of relations between synodality and the exercise of the ministry of the Bishop of Rome, Pope Francis stressed the great importance 
of this topic and ensured that it is already a central topic of reflection for the group of eight prelates he's chosen to help him govern the church, which was already a departure from the Catholic understanding of how the church was to be governed. In his opinion, it is necessary to look for a, quote, new road for synodality to express, quote, its own singularity, singularity united to the Petrine ministry, close quote. So Francis has already made it very clear that his intention is to restructure the church and actually restructure the papacy at the same time. At the ceremony commemorating the 50th anniversary of this institution of the Synod of Bishops, the 17th of October 2015, again, uh, Francis addresses the Synod of Bishops in the Paul VI audience hall. And there he talks about his concept of the synodal church, a church which basically is governed by synods of bishops. <clears throat> this, is what, this is what he says. Now listen carefully in light of what you'll read in St. Pius X's encyclical Pascendi. Francis says this, but how could we speak about the family without engaging families themselves, listening to their joys and their hopes, their sorrows and their anguish? Through the answers given to the two questionnaires sent to the particular churches, we had the opportunity at least to hear some of those families speak to issues which closely affect them and about which they have much to say. A synodal church is a church which listens. Now notice what he's saying there. Interpret what he's saying. He's saying the synodal church begins by listening to the people, express their sorrows, their hopes, their joys, their anguish, in as far as they are dealing with the issues of life today. That's where the synod is actually going to start. It's going to start with their faith experience. That's exactly what he says here. This is where the whole process starts, of going through the process of arriving at faith and what the faith is and what it means, what it should say. It starts by consulting the people. He did it for the synods on the family through questionnaires. He even had members of families come and speak to the bishops and tell the bishops of the faith experience they have at that moment. That's the raw material from which the bishops are supposed to begin the process of discerning the faith, true faith today. A synodal church is a church which listens, he says, which realizes that listening is more than simply hearing. It is a mutual listening in which everyone has something to learn. The faithful people, the College of Bishops, the Bishop of Rome, all listening to each other. Exactly, exactly what St. Pius X condemns as the very erroneous view of the modernists with regard to what the church, the Catholic Church, should be. All listening to the Holy Spirit. So the faithful people are listening to the Holy Spirit, he says. The College of Bishops, they're listening to the Holy Spirit. And the Bishop of Rome are listening to the Holy Spirit. And they're all equally listening to the Holy Spirit. And they all have to be listening to each other because they're all equally listening to the Holy Spirit. He goes on, the Synod of Bishops is the point of convergence of this listening process, conducted at every level of the Church's life. The Synod, of, the synod process begins, now listen, exactly Pius X's point. The synod process begins by listening to the people of God, which shares also in Christ's prophetic office, according to a principle dear to the church of the first millennium. And where is getting this? Quod omnes tangit omnibus tractari debet. What touches all must be touched by all. I've never heard this before in my life outside of his statement here. <clears throat> so, in other words, if the faith touches all, 
it must be touched by all. So everybody must have input because everybody's going to have outputs. The synod process then continues. It starts with the people, listening to the people. He says, the next step then in the synod process is to uh, continue by listening to the pastors. And through the synod fathers, the bishops act as authentic guardians, interpreters, and witnesses of the faith of the whole church. So they're going to interpret what they're told by the people. They're going to witness to what they're told by the people. And they need to discern carefully, to get this, the bishops need to discern carefully from the changing currents of public opinion. This is, this is the, the fodder of faith. This is the, the fundamental ingredients of faith that we're talking about here, coming through the people, their experience of living the faith, and then the bishops having to discern here from the changing currents of public opinion. This is where this all comes together and gets passed on to the, 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 the Supreme Pontiff of the Novus Ordo. Uh, Francis goes on, on the eve of last year's synod, I stated, for the synod fathers, we ask the Holy Spirit, first of all, for the gift of listening, to listen to God so that with him we may hear the cry of his people. So in other words, again, it all gets back to hearing the cry of the people to listen to his people until we are in harmony with the will to which God calls us. <clears throat> the synod process, he uses that expression over and over again, the synod process culminates, culminates in listening to the Bishop of Rome. Finally, the Bishop of Rome gets his say, who is called to speak as pastor and teacher of all Christians but not on the basis of his personal convictions, but as the supreme witness to the Fides Totius Ecclesiae, or the Fides Totius Ecclesiae. He is the supreme witness of the faith of the whole church. Now, how does he discern the faith of the whole church? By listening to the people and having that then passed on through the pastors to the bishops. The bishops then communicate that to him and he is the final expression of the synodal process because he's going to listen to the people, the voice of the people, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God, according to the modernist idea. And he, the Bishop of Rome, is meant then to give the final expression to the faith experience of the people at this moment in their lives, at this point in time. And so all of the members of the church that have to come together and rally around Francis's expression of what he has discerned, discerned from what the bishops have told him, is the actual religious experience of the people at that time. That is the guarantee of unity of the church. But they all guarantee around this bishop of Rome who's learning the faith from the people through the bishops. He goes on then talking about the necessity of the synod, synod then always being in union with Peter, but not in the sense that Catholics believe, but accepting Peter's discernment of the faith that should apply to all then. Okay, so what comes up to the ranks comes to Peter, Peter makes a statement, and it must all redound back down to the ranks, and everybody has to accept it. Um, strange but true. And he goes on to say, synodality is a constitutive element of the church. It offers us the most appropriate interpretative framework or interpretive framework for understanding the hierarchical ministry itself. So this is his concept of hierarchy. Now, this raises a very important point. If this is Francis's concept of church, an idea that has been condemned as modernism by St. Pius X, and not only by St. Pius X, throughout the entire history of the church, this concept of church is absolutely condemned. If this is Francis' concept of hierarchy and authority in the church, a concept that has con continually been condemned by all the past ages of the church, 
If this is Francis, if this is Francis's concept of the papacy, which has been absolutely rejected and condemned by the church at every moment of her existence, right up through to Vatican II. The question arises, how could Francis actually make the act of formally accepting the office of the papacy when he doesn't even believe in it? What he believes in is not the Catholic papacy, but is something that is actually not only a caricature of the Catholic papacy, which is the very contrary of the Catholic papacy. <clears throat> that the Pope, a Pope has to discern the faith from the people for according to their faith experience at the moment, that he doesn't receive that guidance from the Holy Ghost, but rather he receives it from the people. The Holy Ghost merely makes a good listener out of him so he can listen to the voices of the people, discern their faith experience, and express it for them. This is not the Catholic papacy. This is not the Catholic hierarchy. This is not Catholic authority. This is not the Catholic Church. <clears throat> How is it possible that someone could actually formally accept the office of the papacy that he not only doesn't believe in, but he, 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 about which he believes something totally contrary to the reality? This is a very serious question we're facing these days. People have to begin to face the reality of the situation. They can't keep uh, hiding from it. Um, they're going to be compelled to face this by Francis himself, who is doing everything he can to obliterate the papacy, to obliterate the very concept of the papacy. Eventually, the Catholic people are going to have to come face, going to have to face the reality of what he's doing. And, the, the, and, and understand what's happening, what, what is motivating him, and, uh, and realize that uh, there's a serious, serious problem. Um, you know, there are those who say, well, you can't, um, that, that those who question Francis as being the Pope are attacking the papacy. But those who question Francis as uh, being Pope uh, do not see it that way at all. They see it quite the contrary. They see Francis is attacking the papacy, and they're trying to prevent him from destroying the very concept of it. And I think more and more, uh, the, those Catholics who really have any of the Catholic faith left, any understanding of the Catholic faith, are going to see it more and more that way, that really it's not a matter of attacking the papacy by questioning Francis's papacy, but trying to protect the Catholic papacy from Francis in his effort to destroy it, and the hierarchy, and, the, and Catholic authority, and, and the very con Catholic concept of the Church. He's out to completely uh, destroy these Catholic concepts in the minds and hearts of the Catholic people and replace them with his own radical modernist concept of Pope, a Bishop of Rome, of authority, of hierarchy, of church itself, all to pave the way for the coming of the one world religion, the one world experience of the one world religious sentiment which we'll all share, which will become the religion of the Antichrist. So this is what we're up against right now. So I apologize for speaking at some length about this, but again, the subject is very serious. This is why St. Pius X himself devoted so many pages in a very lengthy encyclical to the treatment of this subject, because he considered it to be so important. And you and I have to consider it to be no less important today that we're living through modernism, the rise of modernism, as he warned us about so many, two generations ago, three generations ago now. Well, with that, we'll, we'll return uh, to our consideration of modernism again in the application of theology. What does the modernist make of liturgy? Again, would you recognize the new liturgy and the modernist concept of what liturgy is supposed to be? Would you uh, recognize Catholic teaching and magisterium and uh, Catholic government and all the rest? 
Would you recognize that in the Novus Ordo? Can you see parallels there? Well, that's what we're going to take a look at next time. God bless you.